Hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk a bit about CDAP plugin development. CDAP, as you all know, is an open source software that a lot of customers, a lot of people, a lot of developers use to do data analytics. Uh, both Prashant and I are going to be co-presenting this. We are from the Cloud Data Fusion team in Google. So let's dive into it. What we will talk about today is we'll talk what plugins are. What are the different types of plugins that CDAP actually supports? We'll talk a little bit about how do you see the annotations on plugins, how to make sense out of it. We'll talk about what schemas, what records are, and how do they get used inside a plugin. Then Prashant will walk you through how do we develop plugins. So basically, how do you write different methods of writing a new plugin code? How do we test? How do we build? How do we package that plugin? He'll talk a bit about how does the UI look like for this? What documentation should we care about? And then he'll walk you through some of the best practices that we have seen through other developers, other users using this, contributing to our open source GitHub repo. And we'll leave you with some references at the end that you can then take a look um, at your own convenience uh, once it's recording and once the stock is available to you. All right, let's jump into it. So first, let's talk about what are plugin basics. If you see below, I have a screenshot from CDAP Studio. And you can see three boxes over there, which defines how a data pipeline is actually architected. If you look at it closely, you would see that the pipeline is trying to read data from a GCS bucket, a Google Cloud Storage bucket. It tries to do some form of transformations using a Wrangler plugin, and then it's writing it back into a BigQuery, which is Google's data warehouse. This individual steps here is what we call as stages of a pipeline. And each of these stage is the usage of a plugin. Plugin is basically an extension to CDAP that provides a very specific functionality. Uh, you can, it's a pluggable framework, so you can extend, you can write your own custom plugins, you can use our Java SDK to actually go ahead and uh, implement these. These are all exposed by our CDAP platform. So we'll go into, into it a bit more. First, let's talk about what is plugin versioning and how do we actually release plugins. So for development, we allow customers or we allow users or developers to create plugin versioning with a major minor fix version with a snapshot. Basically, we follow the Semver versioning. And with a snapshot, any developer can use it for their own development, for their own testing. Once they are ready with all the testing, with the documentation, everything, and they're ready, ready to release it on a hub, you can make it into a regular version. And at that point, your plugin basically becomes immutable. And if you look at our versioning uh, uh, system, like I mentioned, it just follows assembler. And uh, the release on the hub is basically so that everybody who is using CDAP can actually see your plugins that are exposed or that are uploaded into a hub. Let's talk about different plugin types that CDAP supports today. So as the name suggests, sources lets you create plugins that you can read from some particular data source. It could be a database, it could be a file, it could be a data lake, it could be an application like let's say a Salesforce a marketing cloud, or it could just be a Salesforce application and you can actually use it to bring in the data. Next, once your data is there, you want to write it somewhere and that's what we call a sync. So you can have plugins which are writing to, let's say, a GCS or a cloud storage or a BigQuery, which is Google's data warehouse, and we have specific plugins for those, or you can extend to write it to your own particular sync. We have transform plugins, which are very useful when you want to manipulate the data or when you want to transform the data. As an example, let's say you may want to clone a particular column or you want to transform something to a particular date type, and you can use these transform plugins. We have action plugins as well, which are used to define or to be able to take certain actions at the end of your pipeline. These don't really affect the data that itself flows through the pipeline, but they are very useful uh, at the end. As an example, let's say you want to run a particular command or a particular stored procedure on a database, depending on what your pipeline's condition is, and they can be used as an action plugin towards the end of the pipeline. We have analytics. These are used to do joining of the data. So imagine, as an example, you are joining purchases data with customers so as to find out which customer was uh, did which type of a purchase. And these kind of plugins, or the joining plugin, can be used to actually do that. Error handlers are also very useful. 
if let's say you want your pipeline to emit or to redirect certain records which are in error mode or which couldn't be processed to a separate placeholder, you could use an error collector. And then later you can come back and say, oh, why didn't my particular record get processed? Maybe it was a problem with the logic. Maybe it was a problem with the column. But you will not lose these records while your pipeline runs. Instead, they'll all go into an error handler plugin, and you can actually look at it over there. The final two plugins are the alert publishers and the conditions. As the name suggests for alert publisher, you can use or you can create a, a plugin that alerts you on a certain action or a certain stage of, the, of your pipeline run. As an example, you could be sending an email notification if a pipeline failed or if a pipeline succeeded. Similarly, conditions can be used to separate out or branch out your particular pipeline into different uh, formats. So for example, you want to do a particular action when it's true versus something else when it's false, you could use a condition plugin to actually do that. These are some examples of pipe of uh, plugins that already exist with CDAP that we ship with. And these are common across batch or real-time uh, plugins. So as the name suggests, a batch sync would let you write records in batches inside into a sync. Similarly, a Spark compute would let you do Spark operations on a, on a uh, input data format or, or a data frame, and then also would return you a simple uh, RDD object. Next, let's talk about how do you define plugins, or when you actually look at a plugin, how do you know what is it actually doing? So simply, there are plugin annotations. An at plugin would tell you what the type of the plugin is. So as an example, like we talked, it could be a source, a sync, or a transformation. A name would tell you what the plugin is intended for. And like we saw in the previous screen, a batch sync exactly tells you that it is going to be doing uh, writing records into a sync in batches. Description helps build a case for the plugin. So when your customers are looking for what a plugin is actually going to do, uh, they're looking for some more details, description will help you add those uh, uh, plugin information as well. And when Prashant will talk about it later, he'll talk about the best practices of what we have seen there. By default, every plugin property that is required are uh, required properties. If you want to mark them as optional, you can annotate them using nullable so that those are not required at the time when the plugins are actually being executed. Macro is a very useful functionality to define a plugin annotation. So imagine you have properties that you cannot provide at run or at configure time the values and they can be provided at runtime. You annotate those particular fields with at macro and then they get evaluated at the time when the, pl when the plugins are actually running or when the pipelines are actually running. As an example, let's say password. You don't want to define a clear text password during design time, but instead, anytime a plugin or a pipeline runs, you will be prompted to enter a password. You can define that and let the pipeline actually run. Now let's talk about how what do the plugins actually do and how does the data actually get processed. So schema is a basic building block for a plugin, for a data inside a plugin. It defines the structure that gets passed between different nodes. Structures or the schema can be very simple. In this case, just simple property bag, or it can be super complex where it can have a nested property bag. And as an example that you see on the right hand side, it just shows you a mixture of both a simple as well as complex nested uh, data types here. Since we are extensions of Avro, uh, the simple data types that are defined in Avro are supported within our schema types. And, and, and you can take a look at this table at, late, at a later point, just to look at different data types that are defined here and how do we uh, actually use them in the plugin. Uh, this gives you another example, like we have date, timestamp that are also supported through our plugin schema types. Next is a record. Now that we have defined a basic, um, uh, a, a, basic uh, a basic building block called schema, how do these schemas actually get used? So the schemas are used within a record. A record would be a collection or a, it would be a structured collection of all the schemas that are defined for different columns, for different fields that are, get, that are getting used. And a record or a structured record is what either gets read from a source or get written into a sync. And you can use that to, uh, to do your full data processing within a plugin. Next, we'll talk about creating a plugin. I'll hand it over to Prashant to talk about that. So now let's talk about how to write a plugin. 
The first thing you do is to define a configure pipeline method. This method is called once when the pipeline is deployed. And this is where you'd put in your uh, validation logic for all of the plugin configuration. You'd also set the output schema here and uh, register usage of any plugins that might be required, for example, JDBC drivers. It's important to note that macros are not evaluated when configure pipeline is called. You can call uh, plugin config dot contains macro uh, to check if a property um, plugin property contains a macro or not. Next, you want to define the prepare run method. This method is called once per pipeline run at the start of the run. When this method is called, macros have already been evaluated at this point. So you can add validation for any config properties uh, that have macros enabled. In here, you can also add, um, set up inputs for your sources and outputs for syncs and register feed level lineage. You can also create any resources that may be required. For example, in the BigQuery sync plugin, uh, you can create the target data set if it doesn't already exist. Finally, you would also create an initialize method. Uh, initialize is called once per executor. Here you'd add any initialization logic. And uh, if you need to cache any uh, objects or state uh, in the executors, you do that in this function. When initialize is called, macros have already been evaluated. Next, let's uh, briefly look at action plugins. So an action plugin um, runs arbitrary logic at the start or end of a batch pipeline. You can have a pipeline that only has an action plugin and no sources or syncs. So to implement an action plugin, you'd need to extend the action class and implement a run method. So all of the business logic for your action plugin would live inside this run method. You can also implement the configure pipeline method where you'd add validation for your action configuration. Next, uh, let's talk about building, testing, and packaging your plugin. So plugin is packaged um, as a jar and, and a JSON file. So the jar file contains user classes and any library dependencies. And the JSON file contains uh, metadata about the plugin. So things like what are the range of CDAP versions that the plugin is compatible with. It also contains plugin documentation that's rendered in the UI and presentation information that shows that it, that tells the UI how to render the plugin in the Pipeline Studio. So we can define compatibility of plugins with CDAP versions by specifying a CDAP version range in palm.xml. In this example, the lowest compatible um, CDAP version is 6.0.0. So we can we usually bump the lower bound when we add a dependency on a CDAP API that's present in a newer version of CDAP. So in that case, we'd bump the lower bound of the lowest compatible CDAP version in palm.xml. The upper bound is usually set to the next major version. So for current plugins, that would be 7.0.0 snapshot. So uh, for unit testing, um, you'd, usually you'd add the hydrator test dependency in your palm.xml. The hydrator test dependency provides mocks for CDAP classes and various plugin types like sources and syncs. Um, in the unit test, uh, you can basically programmatically define a pipeline um, and provide inputs for each stage where you can provide the config, uh, values of config parameters. And then you can deploy and run the pipeline, and the pipeline will be executed in memory. So for example, like if you're, say, testing a transform plugin, what you could do is you could um, feed your input into a mock source plugin, which then connects to your transform. And then you can write the transform data into a mock sync, where you can verify that the transform data is what you expected it to, expected it to be. The hydrator test dependency also provides some test infrastructure to validate, uh, to verify that your config validation logic is correct. So you can verify that um, you're returning appropriate error messages for invalid user input, for example. You can learn more about unit testing by checking out the plugin development uh, guide in the link below.
Next, uh, let's talk about presentation, documentation, and deployment. So the UI rendering of plugin properties is controlled by a widget uh, configuration file. The file is located in the widgets directory, and the file has to be of the form plugin name dash plugin type dot JSON. So for example, for the GCS sync plugin, the paths to the uh, JSON file would be widgets slash GCS dash patch sync dot JSON. So by default, uh, properties are rendered as a simple text box in the user interface, but you can customize the presentation to use a different interface uh, by um, editing the widget config file and you can use a different widget, like you can use a drop-down, toggle, radio button, or other element. To learn more about uh, UI widgets and presentation, you can check out the link below. So plugin documentation needs to be written in markdown format. The plugin documentation uh, lives in, in, in the docs folder, and it needs to be written, in, it written into a file, which is of the form plugin name dash plugin type dot md. So for example, if you're writing a file source plugin, then the paths to the documentation would be doc slash file dash batch, batch source dot md. So plugins, uh, CDAP uh, supports deploying plugins either through the UI or REST API. To deploy through the UI, go to, you can go to the pipeline studio and click on the plus icon on the top right, which uh, launches a pop-up where you can click on the plugin upload button, uh, which launches a UI wizard. And in the UI wizard, you can basically, you can upload your plugin jar and JSON uh, from your computer. Next, next, let's talk about some best practices. So we recommend that you validate your uh, input configuration at con uh, input configuration at configure time if possible. Uh, this is because it's much faster to uh, correct invalid inputs in the pipeline studio because the UI gives you an immediate indication of where the error happened and how to correct it. On the other hand, if your error is detected at runtime, you'd need to wait for the pipeline to finish running and fail, which can take several minutes. So it's much faster to fix any uh, validation errors at configure time. So we recommend you add um, validation logic at that stage. In addition, uh, we recommend that you're, uh, you add context to your error messages. So for example, if your error message just says, field contains incompatible type, that doesn't really tell the user which field uh, had in invalid input or how to fix it. But on the other hand, if the error message says something like, input field ID is a string, but is expected to be an integer, please change it to integer, then uh, that's an actionable error message that tells the user what exactly they need to do to fix their input. Now some best practices for documentation. Uh, include default values wherever possible. If you can't do that, then at least include a descriptive uh, placeholder message. And um, for UI users, make sure that you uh, document all of the config properties so that um, a new user can figure out uh, what those properties mean and how to use them. And also include usage examples for your plugin in the documentation with some sample inputs and outputs so users can figure out what exactly your plugin does. These are some resources to help you get started with CDAP plugin development. Uh, there's also some links to example repositories, uh, plugin repositories that you can take a look at. Uh, hope you find them useful. Thank you.